Uh, Tom Weisling, W-E-I-S-S-L-I-N-G. Thank you. And could you just describe for what you've been doing uh, this summer and what your job is in this department? Well, my job, I'm an associate professor. I do a lot of teaching, so during the spring and fall semesters I'm busy teaching. I usually teach three to four classes a year and coordinate uh, some graduate students, online graduate students, and I used to under coordinate undergrad students, but my job shifted a little bit now. So I also do research, and my research involves kind of uh, investigating the diversity of insects on milkweed plants across the state of Nebraska, and primarily trying to get a handle on monarch populations, monarch butterflies. We don't really have a good handle on what the density of monarchs are in the state. So the place you start is to go out and start counting them and see what you can find. And I'm doing that with other insects as well. So with your research over like plants, or I mean insects and their baseline, have you noticed a change in numbers post-disaster, post-flood disaster? Have you noticed an impact like post-flood on these insects and their ecosystem? I'm not seeing as in many insects right now as I normally do at this time of year, but I don't know if it has to do with the flooding in mm -hmm. particular. It could just be we're behind. Um, actually, we've had a lot of moisture, mm -hmm. so I think the insects are having a hard time getting going. Insects are cold-blooded animals, so it takes them, they need warm weather to really get going. And I think more, it's been just kind of a strange spring. It's been a little bit different than what we're used to, and then now it's suddenly summer, right? Mm -hmm. And we had a little bit of that last year, so I think it's more related to uh, what the spring weather's been like more than to the flooding. The flooding really can impact insects that are locally, but a lot of insects either overwinter in a place where they're not necessarily affected by flooding. Some of them may be, but it's a fairly small number. But other insects migrate in, so the flooding would have no impact on that, other than they may go someplace, not find what they would normally eat, like a host plant, in which case they would just take off to another area. Now insects that would be impacted are things that rely on water for reproduction, like mosquitoes, and there's a few other insects that are definitely aquatic or semi-aquatic that if they have that extra moisture there, they're going to take advantage of it, and boom, their populations will can really take off. And you may have noticed that with mosquitoes this year. I sure have. But as far as the insects that I see on milkweed, I'm not really seeing any effect that would be based on uh, the flooding itself. But again, we're still developing baseline data for this. And until we get in, in the state, is a huge big state that has all these great eco regions in it. So we've got long grass prairie, we've got mixed grass prairies, we have sand hills, we've got short grass prairie. And we also have kind of an area that I would call like uh, Badlands, which is Toadstool Park mm -hmm. area up in there. So it's not really considered to be a fifth eco region, but uh, it's de definitely diverse. Now, we do have people that work on insects, but primarily people are looking at pest insects, and it's not very often we look at non pest insects. And most of the insects are not pests. So we don't have great baseline data on the distribution across the state. We don't have great baseline data on what their numbers are. So until we establish those numbers, or at least can look back at a historical um, baseline numbers, we can't really say if the populations are going up and down or even if they're changing in distribution until we get that information. Sure. And so you said that this spring has been unusual. Yes. Um, could you elaborate on that personally, professionally, how have you noticed changes and what do you think they might be attributed to? Uh, definitely things are off to a slow start and I would attribute it to a cool, wet spring. It's just been hard for insects to get going and it's been hard for entomologists like me to get out in the field and actually try to figure out what the insects are doing as well. But just personally at home, I have a lot of milkweed plants. I look for a particular type of species of beetle to appear. And three years ago, it appeared by the end of May. This year, I didn't see anything till about in, well into the second week of June. Now, my house is not an indicator of what else is going across the state, but I know when you go out to the very western part of the state, they have blizzards up into, what, mid-May? and that affects not just the insect, but it affects the plants that they eat or whatever the insects might eat. Uh, if there's insects out there that are overwintering, they're in the ground, for example, in the wintertime, 
they're not going to come out until the temperatures are nice and warm, so they get delayed in their emergence. So those are sort of things that I've, I've noticed that would be really applicable to, to the climate, at least the, not the weather that we've had this particular season. Have you noticed that as a trend over past years that it's become more and more? Like cool, wet springs and suddenly summer? Yeah, <laughs> definitely. I think we had one spring out of the last four that you would say was fairly normal. But if I am, well, I always wear shorts, but if I'm wearing a sweatshirt at the same time that I'm grading finals, that's an unusual type of spring. And that's been the past, you know, three out of the last four years have been like that, so. I've seen articles in a bunch of major media outlets that talk about the disappearance of bugs mm -hmm. and how that might be a result of worldwide climate change. Could you speak a little bit on how bugs might be used as an indicator for what some people call climate change? Well, we definitely observe some changes in species. Uh, moving north, for example. Uh, one of the common ones we talk about here is green june beetle. And it's not been reported from southern Nebraska very frequently, but now it's breeding here. Uh, there's other insects that can be seen moving farther and farther north. One of them is an invasive species called the imported fire ant, which started off in the Gulf, right in the Gulf of Mexico. And it's moved now where it's getting farther and farther north. Other insects are doing that as well. Pest insects can do that. Um, many, many different species. Now, the real question is, and this is hard to pinpoint, what is causing this distribution? Insects got this ability to adapt to conditions. So if they, there's always insects that are pushing the range of their distribution. Now, some of them are successful at pushing the range of their distribution. Others will die off. But if the conditions are right and they got all the food that they need, food, water, shelter, or a place to breed, they're going to keep moving farther north and farther north. Now, to escape freezing to death, some of them migrate back down south, but some of them will spend the winter there. And they have to change their body to be able to replace water in their cells with sugars and fats that keep them from freezing. So as long as they're able to do that and the winters aren't too severe, they can keep moving farther and farther north. So climate can affect these things. Um, but really, your question was more along the lines of disappearance. Could it be related to climate change? Again, hard to pinpoint. We have a lot of, of toxins in the environment. We have a lot of habitat destruction going on from, from building and, and various other activities that humans do. Some of it could be attributed to that. Some of it could be attributed to climate. There just probably is not any one particular stress in an insect's life that would lead to it for it to disappear like that. I think that insects will adapt fairly well to anthropomorphic changes. I think they already do. We do have insects that are resistant to pesticides, for example, insecticides. So that actually helps them out. There's a lot of selection pressure on them. As long as there are little pockets that have food, places to breed and water that they can go to, and not be exposed to some of the stressors that they face. I think the insects will survive, they'll adapt, and um, they'll actually do better than we will in the end. I think they, they will actually uh, um, thrive, especially, I think E.O. Wilson or somebody made a statement based on the insects, or we will last 50 years without insects, the insects will thrive within five years or something like that. So. Insects are going to do just fine without us. Now, there are species that disappear. And some species I don't even think we know have disappeared. But one of the, one of the more striking stories, have you ever read a, a Laura Ingall Wilder's book? Silent Spring. Uh, Silence. Well, no, that was Rachel Carson. Oh, yeah. Laura Ingall Wilder on the banks of Plum Creek. She was, what was that TV show? Little House on the Prairie. Oh. Yeah. On the banks of Plum Creek, she, she described this one chapter in her book called The Shimmering Cloud. And the shimmering cloud was ba based on this species of grasshopper called the Rocky Mountain locust, which we think of Middle Eastern locusts, grasshopper swarms that fly around and everybody gets freaked out about it. These are huge swarms. 
the last reported swarm of the Rocky Mountain locusts, which occurred in the 1870s, I think, right when settlers were going west, was thought to be about the size of California. And this is not an unusual uh, type of insect. They would get outbreaks and they'd be vast numbers and then they would basically die down to smaller numbers in subsequent years. So this was a huge outbreak year that she reported this. And by 1907, I think, the last species, or the last specimen of that species was located, or found. Now, caught, extinct, gone. And the reason for the extinction isn't real clear, but one of us thought that it's agriculturally related, that, that their breeding grounds were tilled for growing crops, and they just were unable to have the habitat they needed for reproduction. Not that their food was gone, just that their places for reproduction were gone. So that's one theory. There's other theories as well that you cannot sustain yourself with swarms that are that huge. But other insects do it just fine. So. That's an example of an insect that is well documented that's gone extinct. So they can go extinct, just depends on the type of insect. Unfortunately, the pest insects are the ones that do really well. They adapt really well, so they're a bigger problem. In your travels uh, this summer, have you seen, like, I know there's been a, so many flooded crop fields and places where farmers haven't been able to plant so right. far this summer. And how do you think that affected the insect population in Nebraska? Well, it definitely affects the pest insects, the insects that we rely on the, that crop. For example, if you're not putting corn in, there's a little insect called the corn rootworm beetle that comes and eats the roots of it, and then it becomes an adult. Uh, they could potentially be affected. They could be just fine as eggs, still waiting for next year. They, they, they are adaptable, so they may be waiting. But these insects don't show up to eat the crops. It can affect other insects that feed on them, and that could affect other animals that feed on those insects. So there's this whole food pyramid sort of thing going on, a food chain that can be interrupted because these, these insects that are normally relied on as prey, such as aphids, for example, may not be there this year. They'll be in other areas, but not locally in those flooded areas. And from what I had seen, there are some amazingly vast areas that have not been planted to anything yet and just the erosion is just stunning so it's going to take a while to recover and get a good balanced ecosystem going again in those areas i know it seems as though you're sort of like a hard science man data and facts and what have you but do you would you give your opinion on why you think people deny or negate climate change uh, I mean, off the scientist route, just me, saying yeah, what I think. You want to say. Uh, I think it's kind of a, a well, okay, there, there's two types. Climate change is a natural process, but then there's, there's anthropomorphic climate change, and I think that's what scares people, and that's what people argue against. And I think that it's a scary thing because, one, our world's changing, what's going to happen to our world? So we're predicted to change two and a half degrees centigrade in the next, you know, by the turn of the century. You know, so we got 85 years, come, or 81 years, coming up where temperature is going to rise to that level. And I think it's just kind of a fear of the unknown. What's going to happen? What's going to happen to our way of life? What's going to happen to my children? What's going to happen to my grandchildren? What's going to change in this world? Are we still going to have enough food? I think the other thing that scares people is it's been made out to be it's going to cost us a lot of money and i think there's a, people are worried about financial impact but you know i i think we need to be proactive rather than reactive about it i mean if, if you have an ecosystem collapse you know how much that costs to fix i mean even if you can fix it and, and make things right in it that allow you to keep using the ecosystem the way it should be used and getting the species in there that keep everything in balance. That's, you can't even put a price on that. So a little money up front to try to prevent that from happening, yeah, I think, I think that's kind of the way to go. Be, be proactive about it. So 
Yeah, I think it comes down to a little bit of fear of the unknown or, or you know, uncertainty of the unknown. For example, I've, I've heard people say, if this is real, what's the impact going to be? We don't know. Things that we're seeing now related to climate, I know I have heard that climate change will impact weather and weather is just going to instead of being fairly normal it's going to it gets on this oscillation where you get these extremes right now what's happening in Europe they have extreme heat you know we're parts of the US are pretty cool right now and we were up until fairly recently so I get that a lot I hear that a lot too well the weather here is cold we just had a really cold spring somewhere else in the world it was extremely hot so there's a balance, but then there's a little bit of the balance is getting a little bit out of cycle and a little bit more extreme. So we have extreme weather events. Um, this was a really bad winter. It was cold. It's the worst I've ever seen. Snow that came down. And I don't have a snowblower. And I regret that. <laughs> and I may have to change that soon. Uh, third snowiest winter on record. I don't know about the temperatures. Uh, we had the blizzards out west. We've got the flooding going on. We can't get much more extreme than what we faced. Uh, now if we have the rest of the summer where we have above average temperatures, which we're not supposed to get, but and you have um, drought, I mean that's, is that what we want? <laughs> Cold wet winters, hot dry summers. I mean that, that affects how, that affects our way of life in this state. Robert Wright, I'm a professor of entomology and extension specialist. If you could give us kind of a broad overview of, you know, the flooding happened in March, how has that affected insect populations across the state? Uh, it varies a lot by location and the particular insect, but uh, we could break it down in two ways. Uh, some insects that are crop pests overwinter in Nebraska and some overwinter to the south of us and migrate up each year. So those mig migrating insects weren't affected by the flooding, but the resident insects, uh, depending on how long they were underwater, they could have mortality because of flooding. Insects need oxygen to breathe, and uh, they can drown in the soil if there's no oxygen because of flooding. And so in some cases, uh, you know, maybe reduced insect numbers of crop pests because of the flooding. But in many of those fields, they're not able to plant crops anyway, so it's, it may not have that much of an impact on that particular field if there are not going to be crops there. In a field that you can plant, how does a decreased insect population affect that area? Well, it would be beneficial for so the, some of the, the pest insects. There also are beneficial insects that are in the soil, too, that uh, could be killed. So. Uh, it could, you know, have a variable impact depending on exactly what crop and what, what pests are there. Can you explain a little bit what those beneficial insects do? Well, they feed on other insects, including plant feeding insects that are pests. So there's a lot of, there's several predatory insects that, that are in, live in the soil that are beneficial and feed on other insects, and uh, those could drown as well as the plant feeding insects. So, um, in addition to speaking about um, the ways that the flood has kind of changed the landscape of our state, we've become interested as the project's gone on about the broader impacts of climate change. Um, you know, we've noticed that a lot of people have told us that causes bigger, severe weather events across the state, but it also causes lots of other things. Have there been indicators in this state and across the Midwest um, of like ways that climate change has affected insect populations? Well, the main one big issue we've seen over time is that uh, the northern range of some insects is expanding, so we're getting some insects over the last 20 or 30 years that used to be not able to overwinter in Nebraska are migrating further north or expanding their range, so we're seeing some southern insects uh, expand up into Nebraska that didn't used to survive up here, so that's one change. Uh, a long-term change. So we're seeing some new insects that didn't used to survive or maybe they're showing up earlier than they used to uh, because of climate change.
Sure. I know that when species shift around, that can cause ecological problems and make changes. Have, have those insects caused any adverse effects? Well, some of these are crop feeding insects, so they're, they're new pests that we didn't use to see. Uh, one example we're seeing on campus is there's a, a big beetle called a green June beetle, and actually we've monitored it in Nebraska. It didn't use to overwinter in Nebraska, and starting in the late 70s we saw it in extreme southeast Nebraska, and the last couple of years we've seen it in, on the east campus here, so it's, it's expanding its range further north than it used to be and it, uh, not, it's a, can be, the larvae can feed in, in the soil on turf, it can be a turf pest. The adults feed on uh, particularly tree fruits, uh, uh, could be on grapes or in home gardens and apples and peaches. Uh, so this didn't used to be a pest in Nebraska but the last 30, 30 or actually more like 40 years it's been moving further north than it used to, probably because of uh, decreasing uh, winter mortality in Nebraska. Mm -hmm. If climate change continues to go unchecked, does, do those situations get worse? Do we have more crop feeding pests in Nebraska? Does that cause bigger and bigger problems down the line? Well, it'll be new, new pests. Uh, trying to think if there's any cases where the Nebraska insect has decreased because of climate change. I can't think of anything right off the top of my head. Absolutely. The, the main thing would be decreased winter mortality of some insects that overwinter in Nebraska if we have milder winters or less extreme uh, cold temperatures. Now the one thing I was just thinking, broader impacts of the flood, having the standing water, we're seeing more mosquitoes this summer. That's an ideal habitat for mosquito breeding, especially as we get into the warmer temperatures when mosquitoes can, can grow quicker. So that's, that's a short-term uh, impact of the flooding is that in some areas we're going to see more mosquitoes than we normally would because of all the standing water.